a new military partnership is taking shape in West Asia, and the West won't like it. We're talking about Russia and Iran. What do they have in common? Western enemies. It's a partnership of convenience, you could say. Both Iran and Russia face Western sanctions, so they're working together. Last year, Iran armed the Russian military. Iranian drones were used in the war in Ukraine. And now they're taking it to the next level. Russia is giving Iran cyber weapons. Reports say Moscow is sharing cyber warfare capabilities. This is an exchange of Iranian military supplies. Russia has provided cutting-edge technology to Iran. This includes eavesdropping devices, advanced photography devices, and lie detectors. One report says Moscow could have also shared advanced software with Iran. This is software to hack phones and systems. It can be used against dissidents and adversaries. What else is Iran getting from the Russians? Internet censorship software. The term is self-explanatory. Reports say this software can monitor, intercept, degrade, and even deny mobile communications to all Iranians. This can be a powerful tool in the hands of the regime. Just look at the recent events. Last year, Iran witnessed massive protests. It was the most serious challenge to the regime yet. It started with the death of Masha Amini, a 22-year-old woman. She died in the custody of the morality police. Amini's death led to a nationwide uprising. Tehran responded with a fierce crackdown. All communication networks were blocked. The state came down hard on the protesters. Some 500 people are said to have died. More than 19,000 were arrested. So the new gear from Russia could enhance the regime's surveillance power. These capabilities can also be deployed against the West, specifically the United States. And cyber weapons could just be the beginning. Iran is looking to get more lethal Russian supplies. I'm talking about advanced military fighter jets, helicopters, and air defense systems. Russia is said to be working on these plans. And this could have ramifications well beyond Ukraine. With Russian military equipment, Iran could change the security dynamics in West Asia. Russian arms could protect Iran's nuclear program and nuclear sites that are often a target of Israel. Iran can become a more dangerous power in the region. This poses a direct security challenge to the U.S. And the world was recently reminded of these risks. American bases in the region were targeted. They were hit by drone strikes, engineered apparently by Tehran. A U.S. contractor was killed. Five U.S. service members were injured. In response, the U.S. conducted retaliatory airstrikes. President Biden had this warning for Tehran. An Iranian-backed militant uh, groups used an unmanned aerial vehicle <clears throat> to strike one of our facilities, causing several American casualties. Make no mistake, the United States does not, does not emphasize, seek conflict with Iran, but be prepared for us to act forcefully, protect our people. But warnings will not be enough. With Russia's support, Iran's military power will get a serious upgrade. Iran and Russia are also planning to set up a drone factory. It will be based in Russia. Once ready, the facility will produce at least 6,000 drones. The plan is to upgrade the Shahid 136. It's the same drone that is being used in Ukraine. Russia and Iran want to upgrade it. The new drone will have a better engine, we are told. It will fly faster and farther. Once ready, the same drone could also end up in Ukraine or in Tehran. Either way, the West needs to prepare for the fallout. It will face a bigger security challenge on two fronts. And now let's talk about what's happening on the front lines. There's a lot to unpack. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was in Zaporizhia. Russia fired supersonic anti-ship missiles in the Sea of Japan. The United Nations Security Council refused to probe the Nord Stream pipeline blasts and NATO tanks have started rolling into Ukraine. Let's start with Japarizia. The town is home to Europe's largest nuclear power plant. It is located about 50 kilometers away from the main city. While the city is in Ukrainian hands, the plant is not. Russia has controlled the plant since the beginning of this war. President Zelensky met the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi. He inspected the Japarizia nuclear plant. It's part of his role as a global nuclear watchdog chief. After the check, he met with Zelensky, and this is what he said. This is my seventh uh, trip to, to your country since the war uh, started, uh, which is also an indication of my deep commitment uh, for as long as it takes, as all your friends around the world tell you. Modestly, uh, we are trying to do the same. So, um, the situation, of course, at the plant is not getting any better. Uh, the um, 
naturally because the military activity is increasing. The activity he's talking about is the constant shelling of the nuclear plant by the Russians. The city faces regular attacks. Power supply to the nuclear plant has been cut many times, and this is very dangerous. Nuclear reactors need power to cool down. If they don't get it, there could be a nuclear disaster. The plant could become another Chernobyl. Zelensky keeps raising the threat. He says Russia must be forced to leave and that all of Europe is in danger. But right now, it's Japan that is feeling the danger. Russia is conducting naval drills in the Sea of Japan. It test-fired supersonic anti-ship missiles. They were fired at a mock target about 100 kilometers away. Russia says the test was a success. But it also succeeded in pushing Japan on the edge. We are aware that the Russian Ministry of Defense announced on March 28th that missile ships of the Pacific Fleet conducted cruise missile launch training in the Sea of Japan. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues, Russian forces are also becoming more active in the Far East, including Japan's vicinities. The Japanese government will continue to monitor these movements of the Russian military. Russia's test could be a routine drill, or it could have been a warning to the West. You see, two events have taken place that could have upset Russia. The first was at the United Nations. Russia moved a resolution. It wanted a probe into the Nord Stream sabotage. Gas pipelines, they came under attack last year. They were essential to Russia's business interests in Europe. There was a blast in September. Russia blames the West for it. It wanted a United Nations-led investigation, but Russia's resolution failed. The West abstained, and it only shows them in poor light. Why resist an investigation if they had no role in the blast? But as things stand, the United Nations will not be investigating, and Russia says it will keep calling for a probe. The other thing that may have irked Russia is that NATO tanks have arrived in Ukraine. This is a video of the UK's Challenger 2 tanks. Ukraine's defense minister seems quite excited about it. Marvelous. When? Secretary of Defense of the United Kingdom. It's a very good stuff. Thank you very much from Ukraine to the United Kingdom. The German Leopard 2 tanks have also arrived. Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced this in a rather roundabout way. We stand by Ukraine, which we support politically, financially, but also with arms deliveries and especially with the military training that both our countries provide. Germany and the Netherlands have jointly delivered armoured infantry fighting vehicles and ammunition and are currently preparing, together with Denmark, the delivery of Leopard 1 main battle tanks to support Ukraine in this way as well, in addition to all the other tanks that we deliver, including the very modern ones that we have just delivered. The answer to your question is yes, we delivered Leopard tanks as we announced. Remember a few months ago, the West was furiously debating about sending tanks to Kiev. They were worried it would be escalating the conflict, crossing one of Moscow's red lines. But now that line has been crossed, and jets seem to be next on the West's agenda. So the war looks set to continue escalating. Both sides are upping the ante, and we here in the rest of the world will continue to deal with the fallout. Have you heard of the book Sophie's Choice? It is set during the Second World War. The character Sophie has a very difficult choice in it. One of her two children will be gassed, and she has to pick which one. The term Sophie's choice has come to be used to describe such situations when you have to make an extremely difficult decision and when one outcome is not better than the other. Why are we talking about Sophie's choice tonight? To fully comprehend Pakistan's predicament. Pakistan faces a similar choice as we speak. Should the government save lives? or save the country? Should it help people who are dying or help the economy which is collapsing, which will then lead to more misery for the same people? The immediate crisis is this. There is a dangerous shortage of medicines in Pakistan. Many lives are at stake, but Pakistan does not have the money to pay for those medicines. That's because it is trying to avoid bankruptcy and not importing life-saving drugs. The crisis began in January, but now matters have come to a head. The import of drugs has been cut drastically in Pakistan. There are about 100 crucial medicines that Pakistanis need. They include drugs like general anesthesia, vaccines, cancer therapies, fertility drugs and more. Last month, there was a shortage of basic drugs. 
like insulin and disprin, which is a medicine for headaches. And now the situation has become worse. At the same time, Pakistan is struggling to keep its economy afloat. It needs to shore up its finances, and that cannot happen without an IMF bailout. That's one part of the problem. Here's the second part. Islamabad is caught in a dispute with the pharma industry. The industry wants to jack up prices of drugs by at least 38%. And they have good reason to ask for this, a 38% price hike. Their first problem is inflation. Prices of raw materials have gone up significantly, so prices of drugs have to be adjusted accordingly. Their second problem is the Pakistani rupee's value. It continues to fall. Today, one US dollar is worth around 284 Pakistani rupees. That's very bad news for Pakistan's pharma industry. It depends heavily on imports. It gets most of its raw materials from outside. 95% of the raw materials used in medicines in Pakistan are imported from countries like India and China. So when the Pakistani rupee falls, these imports become more expensive. So inflation at home and higher costs of imports are squeezing the pharma industry. Many companies have stopped importing essential drugs. The industry faces a risk of collapse. The Pharma Manufacturers Association of Pakistan has spoken out. I have a quote from their chairman. Listen to what he said. The local pharmaceutical industry is on the verge of collapse because of no corresponding adjustment in pricing despite a 60% increase in materials as cost in recent years. What is Islamabad's response? They have rejected these demands and now some companies could be forced to give up. Three weeks back, the pharma industry issued a warning. It said dozens of companies will be forced to shut down. Drug production has already dropped by more than 20%. Banks are no longer funding these companies. And guess who is paying the price of all of this? The patients. They're desperate. Many are resorting to smuggle drugs. These are obviously expensive, more expensive. But some of them could also be dangerous. There is a high risk of counterfeiting. And there's a large number of people who cannot afford to buy from the black market. What happens to them? The government of Pakistan has no answers. The crisis is fundamentally about the shortage of dollars and Pakistan's weak foreign reserves. Reports say Pakistan has just about four and a half billion dollars in forex reserves. The money may not last for even a month. And this is the choice that Islamabad faces today. If it uses the existing reserves to ease the supply of medicines, the country will be bankrupt. Like I said, there are no easy choices. What about the IMF bailout? So far, Pakistan has been unsuccessful in securing one. Islamabad needs $1.1 billion from the IMF immediately. But it's not been able to prove its creditworthiness. Also, there's no telling where the money will end up, even if Pakistan gets it. So as the wait continues, the lives of tens of thousands of patients hangs in the balance.